All right, man, peace. You know, brothers, I was just thinking about it as I watched this segment here with Mr. Dana White, the face of the UFC, that he truly is in a very advantageous position. He pretty much is a proverbial sports pimp. He has all of these elite level fighters who are willing to endure broken bones, eye sockets, dislocated limbs, etc., just for the glory of saying that they're the best fighter in the world. Very few of the fighters on the UFC roster are actually cognizant of the business aspect. So that puts him in a great, great situation. And he sat down with Stephen A. Smith and Max Kellerman and they covered a bevy of items, including John Jones, the aftermath of Khabib Namagamenov and Conor McGregor, as well as the Daniel Cormier fight that just occurred last weekend. So they're going to talk about it. I'm going to chime in. And it gets better. UFC 230 goes down this Saturday night at Madison Square Garden, highlighted by the main event between Daniel Cormier and Derek Lewis. Here to preview the big event and talk all things MMA, UFC president, our friend Dana White. So good, good to have see you, you with us. Good morning. Good Hanging see. out in New York a lot. We like it. Yeah, I'm going to be here a lot more. Right? That's good stuff. It means big fights here. Uh, fighting. Um, before we get into 2.30, I gotta ask you about Khabib and Connor. So the Nevada State Athletic Commission extended their bans. What, what's the latest in terms of when they can return? Yeah, Octagon? that's normal though, because we haven't had the hearing yet, so they extended it, uh -huh. you know, to make sure they don't fight. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'm hearing that the, the it's gonna take place in November, so. Okay. I have you know, when I first heard about the situation with the Nevada State Athletic Commission, I was under the misperception that the Nevada State Athletic Commission could only stop McGregor and Nurmagomedov from fighting in Las Vegas. But from what Dana White is about to state here, they seem to have some clout over whether or not those fighters can fight for the UFC period. So I found that very interesting. I have a question for you. I've been dying to ask you this. Nurmagomedov came out after the fight um, because he was hearing that his brother was going to be, you know, a band or whatever the case may be. I think it was his brother. No, but it was a stable mate. Stable mate. I'm sorry, I apologize. Stable mate. <laughs> he was saying, if that guy goes, I go. And he was pointing to you and the UFC and how the fight was promoted. As he should have. There's nothing more frustrating than having a figure that's supposed to establish discipline and decorum who is derelict in their duties. Even if you're in school and there's somebody there who's trying to give you a hard time. And you know that if you strike back, you're going to get detention or suspension or expulsion. If that teacher or that authority figure is derelict in their duties, that puts you in a position where you have to take the law into your own hands. And that's very frustrating if you're somebody who normally conducts yourself with the level of understanding pertaining to the repercussions of your actions. And oftentimes, when you see that the so-called authority figure is not getting their job done, it makes you even more angry when you finally spaz out on the person that's trying to mess with you. So Dana White does deserve to be at the center of Khabib's ire. So his whole thing was is that Conor McGregor was allowed to get away with saying all of these things, attacking my country, attacking my, you know, patriotism, attacking my religion, etc., etc. His father. Right. And, and he said, but yet I'm suffering. What did you make of all of that? Did you feel he had, did you step back after a while and say he had a point in any way? Let me say this very quickly before Dana White responds. Of course, I'm sure that he's going to castigate or attempt to castigate could be to a certain degree. But let me say this. Sometimes when extreme measures are taken, that forces those in authority to do their job. Anyway, no. So here's the thing. What, what a lot of these guys don't realize is that we're the Nevada State Athletic Commission oversees the UFC. Okay. They, 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 you know, just like they suspend him and, 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 and are going to suspend, you know, his buddy. They can do that to me. They can do that to the UFC. They can, they can do it to the government. They can do whatever they want to do. That's Once again, I had no idea that the Nevada State Athletic Commission has such a scope of power. Now, if Dana White is misrepresenting the level of power that they have, one of you brothers who have greater understanding about this situation can inform me. But in regards to what Dana White is stating, I was under the assumption that the Nevada State Athletic Commission could only stop fighters and could only stop certain combat corporations like the UFC from staging events in that state. I had no idea that the Nevada State Athletic Commission could tell Dana White that not only could Conor McGregor and Khabib not fight in Nevada, but that they were not allowed to fight anywhere. That's what a lot of these guys don't realize. So they think, these guys think at the end of the day that I am the end all be all 
most powerful guy. Yeah, they blame you say. all the time. Exactly. <laughs> well, you create that dynamic because pretty much you have these guys like hoes. You're pretty much the master pimp, and you treat them like hoes, and they have the mindset of hoes. That, that's that's all the it's me. This isn't me. This is the Nevada State Athletic Commission. And absolutely, what Conor McGregor did was wrong. Conor McGregor was arrested. He went to jail. Yeah. He had to go before. Right, but the reason why Conor McGregor eventually was arrested and went to jail was because of the overall atmosphere that you encourage and that you allowed. And I'm talking about over the course of Conor McGregor's long and storied history with the UFC. I'm not even just talking about in the buildup of this fight. Now, in regards to Conor McGregor's conduct at the press conference prior to their fight, we can blame Dana White directly for that in regards to the reverberation that it had in the aftermath of the fight. But over the course of Conor McGregor's career, Dana White has allowed Conor McGregor to walk the line and step over the line repeatedly in regards to how he treats many of the other fighters. And Khabib has seen this over the long haul. He feels like there's a double standard. And that's why there was so much frustration. Before, you know, he, he had to come here, go to court, pay tons of money and, and go through the system the way that he did. Now, in Nevada, Habib jumps over the cage, his buddy jumps into the cage, they start attacking Connor. This can't happen. It cannot happen. So, so th there are rules, there are penalties, and now we will go before the Nevada State Athletic Commission, and this whole thing will shake out however it shakes out. It's not me going after his guy for jumping in. Well, Dana let Connor say this. And they always say Dana, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's the because Dana is daddy. Dana White is their daddy. So who else are they going to blame? He's the face of the UFC. He's the one who's always on television talking about what he's going to allow from his fighters and what he's not going to tolerate. So who else are they going to blame when they feel like there is an unjust or, or an undue amount of anarchy occurring? Who else are they going to point the finger at? It's the law. It's the law. Yeah, right. Exactly. You're like, I got power, but not yeah. that much power. Connor no, thought he could fly in from Ireland and throw things through buses and, and no you go to jail, to jail and went to court and got lucky that it didn't try to turn out worse for exactly. him. no sir there's no such thing as luck when it comes to a court proceeding the reason why conor mcgregor was allowed to walk in regards to what he did which any other person or regular person does that and they're going to jail if not prison no doubt about it the reason why conor mcgregor was allowed to walk was because he had enough money either in his own pocket or also with the assistance of Dana White and the UFC to offset the charge. All crimes are commercial. They all have a commercial value. And if you can offset the amount of the charge, quote unquote, they will let you walk. Exactly. Right, like that wasn't sure to go Connor's way. Exactly. And no, no, Max Kellerman, actually, it was a short thing that it was going to go Conor McGregor's way. Yes, it was. And this is exactly what's going to happen to, to, to Habib and his, and his crew mm -hmm. when, when they go before the Nevada State Athletic Commission. So, meantime, there's a heavyweight title fight going on, coming up. Yep. And it occurs to me... Let me say this very quickly before they move on to the next topic of the heavyweight title fight, which already occurred. Once again, Daniel Cormier was able to be triumphant over Derek Lewis. But just getting back to Khabib, Dana White seems to think that Khabib is just going to take his punishment. I don't foresee that. I, I can foresee Khabib saying, I'm going to leave the UFC and go fight for another organization. I can definitely see that. To me, not only in boxing has it changed, where the heavyweight championship of the world is not always the biggest prize anymore, right? Pacquiao and Mayweather, guys starts at flyweight and junior lightweight, they make the biggest fights. But in the UFC, it's never really been the heavyweight title. That's been the biggest deal. Maybe because once upon a time, the light heavyweights were where it was at. Yeah. But you got the heavyweight championship of the world. How important is it for the UFC, and we can talk about the matchup in a second, to, to pump that up, that the heavyweight championship of the world, right. the baddest man on the planet, means something? Well, I think it's always, it always has to do with fights. Who's the, who's the champ and who's fighting? And obviously, Cormier is one of the greatest of all time. I mean, this guy is... The Cormier is already on record as stating that he does not want to fight John Bones Jones at heavyweight. I believe it's because he's still in awe of John Bones Jones' skill level. And he does not want to lose his heavyweight belt to John Bones Jones like the ass whoopings that John Bones Jones handed him in the light heavyweight division. Is the current Especially. light heavyweight champion and the current heavyweight champion. You couldn't ask for a better human being. You couldn't ha ask for a better world champion to represent the sport. Who believes he was else. cheated out of his rightful place versus John Bones Jones? By well, that's his alibi. 
But let's be for real. Daniel Cormier, in his deepest, darkest moments, when he's looking in that bathroom mirror in the morning, he knows that John Bones Jones is on a whole other level from him. John Bones Jones is pretty much on a different level from anyone who's ever stepped into the octagon, other than maybe Anderson Spider Silva. Cheating, but he believes that. Right. No, no, he definitely believes that. And uh, now you have Derek Lewis coming off an incredible win, um, you know, uh, on the Habib Connor yeah, card. Okay, and yeah. Daniel Cormier stated that Derek Lewis's power was amazing. He said that every time that he was hit by a kick or a punch, the only thing that he thought to himself is that Derek Lewis's power was like otherworldly. That's why he knew that he had to take him to the ground and take him out. And uh, the, the guy is super interesting, uh, incredibly powerful, can end the fight with one punch, and he's the number two ranked guy in the world. I got, I got, I got a chime. Keeps upset, hold on, keeps Max. upsetting the other. Hold, hold on, Max. I got, I got a chime in here because you're gonna laugh at this. Now, Dana, love you, man. I, I gotta ask you, Derek Lewis, 21 and five. Nicknamed the Black Beast. Yep. Got a lifetime deal for free Popeyes. Okay? A lifetime deal for free Popeyes. All right? I, I ain't mad at him. I'm mad at him. Tremendous power. I got it. <laughs> but UFC 229 was October 6th. Yeah. What's today's day? I mean, does this... Four weeks later, but how they still in the old days, I mean, does, does, does a guy... Does a guy that has a, that has a lifetime deal with Popeyes <laughs> need to be... Uh, who almost passed... I mean, Max, you know, listen, even though he won the fight, he almost lost the fight because he was damn near ready to pass out. Yeah. The, that Stephen A. Smith, I guarantee you that his stamina is ten times better than yours. You probably could not even shadow box for three minutes in a row. That guy need to be fighting four weeks later against Daniel Cormier? Yes, and, and actually, if you know fighting, you're better off to keep a guy like that active. <laughs> Absolutely. Certain fighters have to work themselves into shape by engaging in real matches. For example, Muhammad Ali, when he first came back, he got into amazing shape on the outside. When you look at his fights against Jerry Quarry and then Oscar Bonavena and Joe Frazier, his physique looked good on the outside, but on the inside, he still was not in good condition. And after he was defeated by Joe Frazier in their first fight, he put on some weight. But even though he got a little bigger on the outside and there was some fat around his midriff, with every fight that he fought, he was getting in better and better aerobic conditioning. I believe he took a tour of Europe in the early 70s, or, or really a worldwide tour. He fought uh, Al Blue Lewis, I believe, in Ireland. He fought Mac Foster, I believe, in Japan. A lot of those fights in 1972, 1973, Ali was not in the greatest shape on the outside, meaning his musculature was not all there, but he was building up his stamina because he understood that even though his physique looked much better from an aesthetic perspective in his first three fights back, the conditioning was not right, it was not there. So just to get back to the point, sometimes when you're a fat boy, you should be fighting as many fights as possible to make sure that you can at the very least maintain the endurance that you have, if not try to build on it. Keep him in there. Keep him active. He, he'll be in better shape for this fight than he's been for any uh, previous well, fight. So you're, saying, you're saying a longer layoff might have been worse. Yeah. There are certain guys like that. They just cannot get a long layoff or they're going to blow up like a damn weather balloon. There are Good guys, Tony. Exactly. There oh, are guys Lord. out there that long layoffs is the worst thing that can ever happen to them. James Tony. They blow up, they put on weight, they don't stay in shape, they don't stay active. You're going to see the best Derek Lewis you've ever seen in this fight. Uh, coming off his camp. I remember Ricky Hatton was like that as well. For those of you who remember, a little bit over 10 years ago, there was a junior welterweight slash welterweight named Ricky Hatton who had built a huge name for himself. He was from Great Britain. And he had the habit of blowing up in between his fights. He ended up getting sparked by Floyd Mayweather. Off his camp, fighting uh, the fight that he fought. But Dana, it ain't going to be enough. Well, actually, actually, I, actually, <laughs> actually, I, actually, I don't think you're right about that because he's going against Daniel Cormier. Yeah. But the other thing is, th th these are the type of fights that people always say, oh, this is exactly how this fight's going to go. This right. guy's going to lose. Lewis this got a puncher's yeah. chance always. Yes, he does. He, yeah. Yes, exactly. he does. Exactly. He does. No he, question about that. All it takes that. is one punch to change that fight for, for this kid. No question. Dan, I want to ask you about John Bones Jones because I feel like he's the greatest of all time. He is he's going to be back he's 230. He's the most naturally gifted of all time. For you to be the greatest of all time, you have to have your wherewithal mentally and spiritually, not just physically. 32. What can we expect from him? You know, uh, we, we, we wanted him to be on this New York card. Didn't work out. He wasn't in shape. He needs to 
You know, he's in camp right now. Um, I do believe that layoffs hurt guys. Um, you know, but if you look at layoffs and all the things that can be negative toward a fighter, how much does it really hurt John Jones? Because he was that much he's better so than everybody else. I disagree with all three of you. John Jones could have been the greatest of all time. I agree with you, Max Kellerman. I think that there's a disparity. There's a distinction that has to be made between the greatest of all time and the most talented of all time. John Bones Jones, he reminds me a lot of the actor Robert Downey Jr. They're both preternaturally gifted at their craft, but they're both plagued by demons, particularly that drug demon. His peak may have been the highest, but part of greatness is sustaining it, staying out of trouble, keeping your nose clean. He's like the Aaron Rodgers, the most talented. Uh, not quite. I would not compare him to Aaron Rodgers because I think that Aaron Rodgers has been too functional on the football field for that comparison. I would prefer to compare him to someone who's almost supernaturally or preternaturally gifted in their craft, but there are fears that they're going to snort their life away. That's why I like the comparison with Robert Downey Jr. I've never seen a film where Robert Downey Jr. was not great in it. I've seen films that he was in where the movie wasn't good, but his performances were always good, if not great. Oh, he's the Aaron Rodgers. Rodgers. What you trying to say? I'm what saying that, are you saying about John Bones Jones? I'm saying John Jones may have achieved the highest peak, but he is not the greatest MMA fighter or UFC fighter. I'm saying at the time you saw him fighting, well, did you see somebody that you thought was better? The best I, I, I and the greatest are two the greatest different things. talent. Right. Yeah. He's the greatest talent that we've ever seen in there. And I agree, sir. And I don't disagree with you. All of the things that you say are true. To be truly the greatest and to be the best of all time, you have to have all the other things. And he's still got a chance, on. right? Like, yeah. he can come back and cement his legacy. Freak of nature yeah. talent that could have, you know. I mean, look at the and family. Still can. The two brothers both play in the NFL. Can he still, Dana? Can he still do it, do you think? At his age, given his history, can he still cement his legacy? He's the greatest ever. That's it's up to him and whether or not he can stay away from the booger sugar and the holes, man. He has a serious problem. That's the question. That's a great question. If he can come back and 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 win the title again um, after all he's been through, I mean, even even the things that you just laid out, be tough to deny that he's the greatest ever. He can stay out of trouble. See, it has to be like Tom Brady to be the greatest ever, like five Super Bowls. <laughs> you need Belichick. You need to get John Jones. Well, Belichick. Has a, Max has a well, Tom Brady actually has been in a lot of trouble. It's just not off the field trouble. The both true. ways talk about sustainability but in the same the breath. Talent, Somebody like Tom it. Brady who does it is falling off a cliff. I said he's the greatest of all time. Yeah, Brady's great. the greatest of all time. He's falling off a cliff. I disagree with that. I'll take Joe Montana as the greatest of all time, but that's just me. You look at Clint, when, when you call somebody the goat, you look at what Brady has done yeah. and, and, and consistently yes. still playing at 41 years old. And, and that's what makes you the greatest. We can talk about how John Jones could have been the greatest. Greatest talent. And if he comes back and does this, it's hard to deny. All right. Dana, appreciate you. Looking forward to Saturday. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. But anyway, we'll see how things turn out for Mr. John Bones Jones. He is a wonderkind at what he does, and very rarely in life are people able to discern and decipher what they will put on the earth for. So hopefully he will not allow that tremendous stumbling block of drugs and hoes <laughs> to get in the way of him being able to optimize the gift that the Most High gave him. So peace.